Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Developing My Loving Self Group and is part of an Education and Love series. In the Governing Emotions Question and Answer presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, Governing Emotions. Recorded on the 24th of May 2016 in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. All right, so here we come to uh, our Governing Emotions Q&A. So here's your opportunity to sort of try and get rid of a few of those doubts and problems that we have with this particular discussion. If we start with Alan up the back and then come down to Chris. <coughs> Jesus, I'm in a, a lot of pain in my back. Mm -hmm. where, uh, where in your back? Uh, it's right up the, the centre of the spine and the lower back. Yeah. I got a phone call Saturday night. My son tried to commit suicide. And, yeah. Um, I, I was wondering, I, do I go towards the terror first or do I feel my anger and rage first about what I've created? in my son and it's interesting that whenever something happens to your son you feel an imperative to address something emotionally for yourself but but when something goes if everything's going well for your son then you don't have the imperative true so what i what i'm suggesting to you is that you don't believe you are worth enough by yourself to address things emotionally your motivation is only to do it for your son. This is good. Yeah. And this indicates that you have a low sense of worth, Alan, and hence the lower I back have. pain. Yeah. yeah. You, you're, not, you're not allowing yourself to have the motivation of addressing it for yourself. So, so obviously there's some childhood issues there. But so, so what happens is any time something bad happens to your son where he makes a negative choice or something like that, of, of course you have a tendency to blame yourself and then you have a tendency to desire to fix whatever it is inside of yourself that causes this for your son. Yeah. But, but it indicates that there's not a strong enough desire for you to do it for yourself when everything's going fine. So... so my suggestion is firstly to analyse for yourself why it is that you're not choosing to do it for yourself. Why it is always that it's only your son doing something or not doing something that causes you to reflect. I wrote down last night that I had a false belief that when everything was going good, it's not going to get better. And so there's no action to take at that, that point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is where I feel most people are. They feel like this, having a little bit of pain, is okay. It's acceptable. Um, yeah. and, and this is actually a false concept, of course, mm. this, this concept of pain, because actually our pain is that big and, and your son is reflecting how big your pain actually is. M my pain. Not only your pain, but also now his own. Because yeah. he, he has, as a, as a male, he has the same viewpoint of himself as you have of yourself. Yeah. But he's just taken that additional action of anger towards the world and everyone around him as a result of that particular emotion, which is what the trigger for suicide actually is. It's an anger and rage with the system, if you like. Um, it's a way of getting, you know, forcing other people into acknowledgement that there is a problem type of thing. Um, and so, so a person who desires suicide is trying to force the world around that person to accept there is a problem. Right, which is an indication that the world around him doesn't feel there's a problem until he does that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, you follow me? Yeah, yeah. A lot of the things that you said, I said to him on Saturday night, but I haven't, Di and I have spoke about this since, I haven't gone through it myself. It's just intellectual, I'm trying to help someone. This yeah. is what I heard. And he'll know that. Yeah. He'll know that. Yeah, yeah. No, that our, our children are not silly. No, they they know you know they know when we're telling them things that we're not addressing, but we're expecting them to address, 
and 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 you know what happens when our children generally it, it, for the average parent when their child ha generally has some hardship of some kind the average parent feels sort of guilty or mm. or feels like yeah. they, they have contributed in some way to the child's experience and so therefore they then try to take some action you know to help the child without taking any action to help themselves and this is what i'm suggesting to you is what you're doing you're only taking action to help your son but you're not taking action to help yourself yeah and that's that, an issue of worth yes that's an issue of you feeling that you you know it's only worth doing it for your son and not worth doing it for you the irony is, is if you do it for you you'll know how to how to help your son do it yeah and along with that irony is that I allowed him to cry on the phone for 20 minutes, yep. which I've never seen him do in person, in person. to person. Yep. Um, and then I was praying through that 20 minutes. Yeah. And then he completely changed and I wondered if it was actually him talking because he's been overcloaked a lot through spirits in his life. Yeah, um, and, and spirits would be influencing him to suicide. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of spirits who do that. They try and find a person, a young, you know, oftentimes young people, and who have certain angers and so forth, and then they try to influence them into into taking the action of suiciding. So was he feeling his pain while he was crying, or is it he's still in effect? Well, no, he's uh, feeling some of his pain, but now you're in an, an addiction. Right. right now, of telling a story rather than addressing the issue again with you. You see, every time I raise the issue with you, you refer to your son again. I'm raising an issue with you. You're referring back to your son again. You know, he this, he this, he that, he that. It, it's good what you did with him. I'm not saying it's not. What I'm saying is he, it's good that you allowed him to cry. What I'm saying is you need to cry. Okay. But you yeah. don't want to. I've had a big one cry, big cry since then, but, yeah, but now only, I feel I'm in resistance, it's and only that was the pain. It's only guilt about your son. Yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not about your feelings of how you feel the same as him. Yeah. And, and do you see what I'm saying? You're trying to help someone that you actually feel the same as. Yeah. And what? And the way to help him is to teach him how to cry. How do you teach a person how to cry? How it causes emotion by you doing it. That's how you do it. You can't, you can't teach him anything at this point about how to do it. You can help him to maintain a positive attitude and a positive spirit and so forth, but you can't actually help him do it until you do it. Yeah. And you've got to do it to do this. And, and that's I'm part of the refusal of my rage and Yeah, and, and it's anger. also like even in the conversation, I'm talking to you about your emotion, you're talking to me about your son's emotion. We're on mm. two completely different wavelengths here. I'm trying to talk to you about how you feel. You're trying to talk to me about how your son feels and how to fix that. And almost every conversation I've ever had with you has been about how your son feels and how you can fix that. Yep. But it's not been about how you feel and how you can fix that. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So... So this is what I find with parents frequently is that with most parents, they're, they're talking to me about how their children feel all the time and I'm trying to talk to them about how they feel and how, what the impact that's having on their child and they're trying to talk to me about the child and how they can fix their child and I'm going, well, hang on a sec, we're on a completely different wavelength here until we get on the same wavelength. There's not much that can be done. You, you see what I'm saying, Alan? So, so my suggestion is you need to examine how you feel not how you feel guilt and not how you feel bad about your son feeling that bad, but how bad do you feel? <laughs> you know, what, what yep. personalise, you've got to feel the personal emotions you have. Yep. So, so what, what you're really doing is distancing yourself from your own pain by focusing your attention on your son's pain. And this is, so basically what you're doing is saying you're in this much pain and he's in that much pain. Yeah, that's quite graphic now that you just pointed that out. Yeah, that's really what you're saying. But the reality is complete. What I'm saying to you is you're living in a fiction. This is how much pain you're in too, <laughs> you see. And, and, and you think that because you're in that much pain, you can help a person who's in that much pain. And I'm saying, well, hang on a sec. No, you're not even in that much pain. You're in this much pain. So how can you help another person who's yeah. in that much pain? 
Yeah. You can only help them to have faith. Some of the things you've learnt to do now, have some faith in God's goodness and faith that you can deal with emotion and let him cry and things like that. That's ways you can help because they are things you've learnt. Mm. But, but until you actually release the concept you have about your own pain and you see it's that big and you allow yourself to start experiencing some of it, then it's highly unlikely you'll help him in the long term. Okay, Does thanks a lot. Yeah. Yep. Um, Sam, thank you. And uh, if we come to Deidre and then Glenda after that. I don't feel that I've really dove into my terror really yet at all. Yep. Um, but I'd really like some clarification on whether I'm actually mostly even skipping right over my fear. So I'm. I'm often getting triggered usually and feel anger and yep. then start to really soften and the tears come quite easily most of the time. But And often yeah. I do feel like I'm crying to God and I'm afraid, um, but mostly it is just going straight into the tears. So, yeah, I'm just not sure whether I'm really just skipping right over a lot of fear in that process. Yes, you're doing what many women do. Uh, if I can explain what many women attempt to do, and this is why many women don't progress as much as what they'd hope to, is because let's say this is sort of a timeline where this, where he, here is your terror, let's call that your terror. Now your terror is going to block you towards any real processing of deep emotion. That's the reality. Your terror is there because you're avoiding pain, so there's your pain. Now, some of that pain is actually tears, but other pain is all sorts of emotions, shame and other sort of emotions like that are all related to the pain. There's also fear in the pain, like in your childhood there's fears, childhood fears I'm talking about now. There's a whole heap of false beliefs in your pain, false beliefs about love and truth and so forth. So here we are here and we go, okay, I'd like to progress, so what I'm going to do, because I'm real good at this, I'm going to do this. Okay. So there's pretty much always going to be this terror block that's between those two places. Okay. Always. Yeah, um. until it's released. And so therefore the pain is never really going to be truly experienced fully. And as a result, it's never going to be fully released. As a result, it's always going to... You, you're not going to have experience major law of attraction changes in your life as a result because you're only just letting out the bits you think you can cope with. Yeah, I definitely feel like I've been selective yeah. with the pain yeah. I've experienced. It was about letting out the bits you can think you can cope with. In, in other words, it's about letting out, for most people, they let out the bits they're not terrified about. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. And, um, and that's what you're attempting to do. And, and in that process, you're trying to be selective. Now, now your soul's not built for selective emotion. So you're trying to work around how your soul's been made. If it, did you have you ever listened to the Q and A's we did on the human soul, how it functions? Because it paid to have a listen to yeah. those. Because we talk about f sort of eight different qualities, I suppose, or aspects of the soul that d govern how emotions are experienced. And what you're trying to do is be selective. You're you're trying, so you're suppressing one emotion while you're trying to experience another. So even though there are some changes, like some small changes... You will have small changes, but you won't have any different. large large changes in your life. Mm -hmm. Just small little things, mm -hmm. but no major, major critical changes while you do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then after a while, the small things will dry up because you, you'll end up... What, what most people do is they, they deal with the pain that they have no terror about and there's only a little bit about a little bit of that in in any single person, and so what you happen is eventually that all dries up, and from that moment on you'll go stagnant. You won't experience any more change. Does that make sense? And this is why most people get downhearted too with with divine truth, is they start processing emotion, but it's only the emotion that they're not afraid of processing. So they process the emotion, or they have little fears, but not major terror, you know, about emotion. So they process that emotion, but, but because that emotion, there's only a bit of that emotion, it all just finishes up drying up, and that's the extent of your progress, and that will be all your progress for the rest of your life, even after you pass, until you get through the terror. Until you go back to that block. Mm. 
There's a good example in one of the uh, channelings that Mary did uh, before we started these series of assistance groups. You remember the lady who was a Mormon lady um, and she and she passed. No, not Carolyn Brock. I'm talking about <coughs> the channelling this year. Um, there was a Mandy, her name was. We channelled Mandy and the, the uh, she she passed. Uh, she thought she had dealt with a lot when she passed. She passed and she got involved in these groups who were teaching falsehood on earth and so forth. And eventually she degraded and degraded into a condition where eventually one of her friends would be plucked away and another plucked away and another plucked away and another plucked away and she was getting more and more terrified as she went until she was alone and afraid of these spirits taking her away and and then she cried then she then she went through her terror and at that moment the bright spirits could grab her and and help her does that make sense and so when you say that you're um feeling like when you're being attacked that triggers terror and and you just cry it out like are you releasing your terror then no because there's causal terror that needs to be released well what what causes me to be attacked so i've got to release Uh. what that's all about right so that that's and i've certainly released a lot of that that's all about my first century life and for me you know all my memories if you like yeah yeah the trouble with this global emotion is for most people on earth, the global emotion of terror doesn't have memories associated with it. And that's why you're resistive to feeling, that, feeling it. The global emotion of terror, for the majority of you, you have not had terrifying experiences all through your life. Right? The global emotion of terror, remember I said, a lot of global emotions are multi-generational, passed down from generation to generation. This is an emotion that entered you at the time of conception and therefore there will be no memory of an experience of why you're so terrified. This is why you find it hard to deal with because you're, you're, you're trying to address an emotion that you have... That, that you think you should have an experience of, that you haven't had an experience of, but you still feel it. Right? So the reality is for the majority of people who are on the earth, and not all, but the majority, all, all people, sorry, all people on earth begin with this global emotion of terror. And then in some countries where there is terror, of course, it just adds to it. There's events now that they can remember that add to their terror. But for the majority of people, particularly in Western society, the majority of people have not had events or very many events at all that have added to their terror you know there have been some childhood experiences but nothing that would nothing that would justify the mountain of terror that we feel we have you follow me it's a multi-generational motion passed down from generation to generation at the time of conception you won't have a memory associated with it you just need to go through it and most of you don't want to because it because you because it confuses you greatly you don't you know you want something to you want to understand it before you feel it you follow yeah. now now that these kind of emotions are are going to have a powerful positive effect on your life if you feel them because because they've governed the rest of your life right they're governing emotions they govern the rest of your life but for the majority of you there won't be that's the reason why I broke it up into the three types of emotion. You've got the three types of governing emotion are the global emotions, the multiple event-based emotions, and the single event-based emotions. Now, what I'm suggesting to you, for the majority of you, there's no terror-based or very few terror-based single, uh, multiple event-based emotions, and there's a few terror-based single event-based emotions. But your global emotion of terror has come from generations past, passed down, generation to generation. Everyone in society feels it, and most people do not want to experience it. Right? And most people don't want to experience it for a number of reasons. One reason is that you think you're going nuts when you're doing it. There's no, you don't have any memories associated with, with why it's there, and so, so you don't want to experience it then either. Whereas with single and multiple event-based emotions, there will be memories associated with those things. Do you follow? There will be memories because that's happened to you. Things have happened to you and you'll remember what happened to you if you allow yourself to and you'll go through the event. So it's like a person who's overseas and has been involved in a war zone and there were bombs dropping and, well, there's a, there's a, a, a multiple event-based emotion that they can remember. 
but most of you haven't had that experience here in this audience, right? So essentially, is that what it, the difference is between terror and fear? Is the intensity really comes from the fact that it is so... Yeah, so if, you, if you examine this diagram again, we've got our pain, then we've got our false beliefs and false definitions of love, there's our fears, there are our individual fears about love and our individual fears about truth there, right? But we've got this global terror, this global emotion, capping the, all of that. It says just don't do it, deal with any of it. Don't deal with pain. Don't deal with any emotion. There's this global belief system that's been passed down from generation to generation. That's the one we're making the decisions with. That's the one that triggers the facade, right? triggers the creation of the facade. It's this one here that we need to start to address. And this one is all about denying this and denying this, of course. It suppresses it, it keeps it all down, you follow. So it's really important that we see that this particular emotion is not necessarily a, an experiential emotion in the sense of a, a multiple event experience or a single event experience. It's, it's an emotion that's in you now passed down from generation to generation, multi-generational emotion. It's in you now, it's got to be released and, and it's controlling most of your life. That makes a lot of sense. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. And so, so for the majority of people, they um, feel a bit of fear about a particular event in their life and then they have a connection with the emotion. But while this global terror exists about emotion, and it's about emotion, about feeling anything, about being overwhelmed by anything, um, every single experience is going to be difficult to have. And this is what you're encountering. The majority of you are encountering, it's difficult to even get to one emotion. And the reason why is because this global emotion exists and, and none of you have been willing to feel it. Yep. And I, I'm saying at this stage, Mary's now going through it, but no one else has. <laughs> so... And many of you might think you have, and those who are listening might think they have, but not yet, you know. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yep. So, Glenda, we were up to. Uh, sorry, we're up to Deidre on this side, weren't we? Hi, I'm still Linda. wrapping my head around that one. But with the <laughs> <laughs> diagram, because yeah. as you know, I've been in chronic pain a lot, and I'm so sensitive to physical pain. Yeah. But from that diagram, I'm still yet to even conceive the real pain I'm actually in. Well, you see, by the time it's got to physical pain, it's already a long way gone. Do you follow? Yeah. And also, you're saying you're so sensitive to physical pain. This is the irony. The more you suppress emotional pain, the more physical pain you're going to have. And therefore, the more physical pain you're going to be in. That's the irony of the attempt to suppress pain. The irony is, the more you try to suppress pain, the more pain you're going to end up in. Isn't it counterproductive, eh? Yeah. And it's the global emotion of terror says, no, no, I'm not going to go there, I'm not going to go there, I'm not going to yeah, go there. Yeah, I really relate to that <laughs> <laughs> emotion there. I'm just, I'm still trying to wrap my head around it because I think even feeling physical pain is bad, but really to undo it all it's kind of good because at least you know you got oh. some when you start feeling your emotional pain most of your physical pain will disappear hmm. like I, as i said i like i was i was a physical wreck by the time i was 33 i was i was getting sick every month i was hospitalized quite a number of times i had a bad bad asthma all the time and i, I was a wreck I was. Felt really bad in my body, a lot of pain, a lot of suppression, just really bad. As soon as I started to allow my fear and sadness, my like I said, I went through this period, which I described the other day, period of feeling some terror over a three-month period, never had asthma again. And like I said, I, I went from being sick every month to not being sick for the next 10 years. Right, so and that was just processing that one emotion <laughs> for a period of time over three months. So, oh, I'll probably have so many questions to that, but I'll, I'll let you <laughs> pass on because I could. Yeah, yeah, it's the, a the, lot. 
The problem with this is that, is that now, when we talk about terror, what I've noticed is that you all try to do this. You all try to understand. Mm. <laughs> it's worked real well so far. <laughs> I don't try to understand until I'm done. <laughs> do, you, do you see the difference? I'm not. I in in my experience of terror, I, I didn't try to understand what was going on or why I had it. I didn't even know why I had it. I didn't know why I had three months of terror to feel. Had no idea. No idea. It was only years later, as I said, said in my example, seven years later that I started realising why I even felt that I was tortured. Seven years after I worked through being tortured. I had no idea. I thought maybe I'd been abused in my child, but, it should, but I couldn't remember anything. No one around me could remember it happening either. I don't have any physical marks on this body about, about being tortured. So I had no physical, physical, like outward appearance of, of being tortured. So, but but I knew I had to feel the emotion. So I felt the emotion over a period of three or four months, and I still didn't understand it after I feel, you know, after it all went away. I still didn't understand why it happened. And it wasn't until seven years later that I understood. <laughs> yeah, because I can kind of. Like I'm probably like you were, like I'm just a little bit older than when you were like a bit of a wreck because before I quit my job just to come here, I was getting sick every week. Yeah, yeah. I was, like it, I was sick every, every, every month for one week. <laughs> I'm in bed ridden for one week every month. I had to work for myself because no one would employ me. <laughs> <laughs> And I almost got to the stage of planning for it, you know. <laughs> Three weeks are going to be good, one week's going to be bad. When I could feel it coming on, you know, I organised my life so that all my jobs had to be done the following week. <laughs> it's like crazy. It's amazing what we do. Now, can I just say, you're trying to understand rather than just feel. It's a big problem. Because some of these feelings, for instance, your global terror, you're not going to be able to understand it. It comes from generations past for the majority of you. The like, majority of you haven't had terrifying experience after terrifying experience in your childhood. You know, you know, some, I understand that some of your parents were terrifying, but, um, but usually you know, it wasn't physical, emotional, sexual abuse all of your childhood right? for the majority of you. And even if it was, the global terror is not related to that anyway. Because that there are multiple event based emotions. Global terror is related to times past. It's in all humanity. It needs to come out. God's been trying to pull it out for years. Yeah. And we just avoid, 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 hoping that it will go away. Most of us wake up in dread. Yeah. Okay, if we go to, uh, we were Glenda, weren't we? Yep, so let's go. Um, in previous seminars, you've talked about how anger covers mm -hmm. fear, which covers grief, mm -hmm. and to go through the anger first. Mm -hmm. Well, ang so anger, <laughs> it's more correct to say that anger is the result of an addiction not being met. And why do you have your addictions? Your addictions cover your fears, don't they? Right, so anger is the result of an addiction not getting met, is what I've said to you. Right? So, but your addictions are used to cover your fears. Your facade is all about covering your fears. These addictions, emotional, physical and spiritual addictions, when they're satisfied, they get comfort. When they're not satisfied, they get anger. Yep. It's the same sort of thing. I've just embellished it a bit further. Yeah, so I'm just wondering, though, because anger is the emotion that I am most um, aware of, mm -hmm. not saying I'm feeling it, I'm projecting it, but yep. where does that fit into the deconstruction of the facade? Well, you'll learn that in our next talk. Okay. But basically, basically, if we look at the diagram, we can see that, well, that's all because you still want your addictions met. 
all of your anger is because you still want your addictions met. So you haven't let go of wanting your addictions met. Does that make sense? I'll have to think about it. Not, re- I mean, yes, but yeah. Yes, but what's the problem with it? You, you see, every time yeah. I say that to people, there's some mm. people who say, where am I at now? And I say, you still want your addictions met and you've got to give that up. It's a will-based choice to give it up. You're not making that will-based choice. You, you want instead to have your addiction met. That's why you're getting angry. You want your addiction met. So that's a will-based choice. Wanting your addiction met is a will-based choice. You think you have the right to get your addiction met. That's your will-based choice you're making out of harmony with love. So you're yet to get deconstruct your facade because you can't. You're not going to deconstruct your facade or become a awakening to have an awakening to your sin because you think you're not sinning. You think you deserve to get what you want. Do you follow me? And that's what's causing anger. You're going to have to first feel this anger and feel that it's wrong and out of harmony with love and have an awakening to it before you're going to awaken to your facade. Does that make sense? So you're not even you're not going to deal with any of this yet. Yes. Yeah, so I I do need to. Confront my anger and addictions first before yeah. getting to the terror. Yeah. Well, your terror is driving it. Okay. This is driving it. All of your facade is driven by these the avoidance of pain and the refusal to feel terror. Right. So obviously, if you could start working through working on why are you refusing to feel terror and why are you refusing to feel your pain, it's going to make these addictions disappear a lot more rapidly, isn't it? See, so, see, so you have basically you have. A, a choice be to, be, before you. This is the majority of you are going to only do one of these two t- things, and and the majority of you are going to do the slowest thing. I can guarantee to you, you're going to do the slowest thing because you don't want to do the fast one. Right? From what I'm suggesting, you do the fast one, but you're going to choose to probably do the slow one, and then you're going to get tired doing it, and then you're going to blame me. Right, but what I'm suggesting is yes, there is a whole lot of deconstruction process here in the facade, and the majority of you have have been working on that because you don't want to do this or this. So what you're saying, I can go straight to the terror rather than ignoring that. You can, but you probably won't. Okay. Because <laughs> it's a it's a very you need a very strong faith. You need to develop your faith. You need to have a very strong love of truth. You need to have a very strong viewpoint, God's viewpoint of emotion in order to do it. So, so you need the tools. You need to develop the tools. You can develop the tools and do it, but for the majority of people what happens, and this is exactly what's happened to Mary and exactly what happened to me, is, you, is I went firstly through six or seven years of stuff before I got to that point. right? And Mary's gone through six or seven years of stuff before she's got to the point of facing this. Right? The reality is the majority of you will probably do the same. Like, because, because we need to get to the point where we're even prepared to feel it. And if you're not prepared to feel any emotion, then it's pretty hard to feel terror, you see? So, so what, that's why I say, yes, you have the option. Now, when I say I did it, well, it's probably not accurate. Um, I was in a lot of pain, and the very first emotion actually I addressed was this. Yeah when I was 34. And that had a huge effect on my life immediately, right? But I haven't seen anybody else do that yet. I haven't seen anybody else do it. Even Mary hasn't done it yet. She's doing it now. But, you know, there's been a seven-year lead up to that. It's a decision, a will-based decision that needs to occur. And, and a surrender. It's a, like a... It is a surrender to a very confusing process that you're not going to understand. Now, I, in, 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 in my case, I didn't try to understand it. I, wasn't, I, I tried for a, maybe a month and I gave up because it was too hard. Like, it was just like, I don't understand why all this terror is in me and I wake up in dread every day and I, every day is driven by dread and every day I'm, in, I'm terrified and all these, you know... And I'm starting to now have some memories about terrifying events and so forth, and I've got no idea why any of that's happening. So I gave up trying to find out why and just decided instead to just feel it rather than find out why. In most of your questioning, have you noticed most of your questions are driven, 
Why is it like this for me? Why is it like that for me? Why is it like this for me? Why is it like that for me? And, and that tells me you're trying to find out why all the time. And I, I'm not saying, no, you don't have to find out why, just feel. <laughs> just, just make the choice to feel. Now, when you make the choice to feel, you can make the choice to feel your terror. You can. But, but most of you will probably not do it for a while until you've deconstructed some of this and gotten used to a bit of emotion and also gotten used to the fact that you're totally confused and you don't understand why and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then you might deal with it. Right? Does that make sense, Kaya? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. So the fact that you're angry is the result of the fact you still want your addictions met and you've not removed them. Right? One thing to help you get to here is remove your addictions. All of them. Just cold turkey, all of them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Every time you're angry, it tells you you had an addiction. Every time. So you go, here I am again, write down that one. What did I want? <laughs> What did I want? Why am I angry now? Oh, I wanted them to do this for me. Okay, I want people to do things for me. Well, oh, why was I angry there? Oh, I was angry because that person cut in my line. Oh, I felt undervalued, so I'm angry because I'm undervalued. Um, you know, people at work didn't pay me the right amount again, you know, so I go, I have to do it all again with them. And why am I angry about that? Like, why does it keep happening to me? Obviously, attraction event. Why does it keep happening to me? Why am I angry about it? I'm angry about it because. You know, I keep I keep having to use my time on this. I, I, I deserve that amount of money and I should have got it. And I keep having, to, you know, there's another addiction. So you write down whatever the, the addictions are. You just write them all down and then cold turkey them. Don't satisfy any of them. And then you know, you know what you'll feel? You'll feel terrible. Yeah. You will. You'll go through a period where you just feel terrible. And then you'll be tempted to deny you feel terrible and then you'll be tempted to use another addiction like food or something else to feel good about yourself and then you'll realise you're doing that so you write that down again as well. There's my go-to if that doesn't work. And, then, and eventually you remove a lot of them. You get to the stage where you've removed a lot of them and now you have an, an awakening to the sin and the awakening to the sin will cause you to desire to deal with its cause. And the cause of the sin is because you're refusing to feel terror and you don't want to feel your pain. That's the real cause of your sin. Now you've had an awakening to it, now you might deal with the cause, you see. So for the majority of people, as I've just said to you, the majority of people will have to go through this cycle up here first, deconstructing what's going on up here first before they even see, feel. Like it, When I say see, I mean feel every time. You know, like You guys, I draw a diagram on the board and you think you see it. Right, you don't. You're not going to see it until you feel it. And for many of you, you're not going to feel it until you've worked through this facade enough to see the creation of this in. You've accepted the facade, you've gone through the emotion of accepting it, and then you've also started the process, as we'll go through in our next talk, the process of deconstructing it. You started to do that. And then all of a sudden you start realising, oh, it's really only two things that are my main problem. And once you get to that point at a soul realization level, now you might address. Things. Now, for me, that soul realization level happened very rapidly right at the beginning. Right? And that was because I was humble to emotion. Because I, I realized that no, this is all just emotion and I don't have to understand it. I've just got to feel it and get rid of it. And the only way I'm going to get rid of it is by feeling it. So I just need to feel it. It doesn't matter how it got there. It doesn't matter who put it there. It doesn't matter what I believe about it. It doesn't even matter if I'm, you know, what I know about it. I've just got to feel it. Feeling it will release it. And so I chose to release it. But it requires a pretty humble person to do that. And as I've said to many of you, you've not learnt humility yet. So you're going to have to go through the process that you need to discover your own humility, the own, which is awakening to the facade, isn't it? Accepting the facade is humble, isn't it? It's like, a, oh, this is how it is. This is where I'm at. This is what I do. And once you are humble enough to do that, then you've got the ability to deconstruct the facade. So when we go through the deconstruction of the facade process, which is really the question you've asked about, Glenda, you might yeah. help understand a bit more okay, thank about you. what's going on. Yeah. If we go to Diane on this side. 
Um, I've got a two-pronged question. It's kind of the same and it's yep. about the global terror yep. and repentance. And as a parent, if I go through the repentance of the pain that I've created mm -hmm. or I go through hopefully and I go through the terror, does that have any effect on the pain in my children or their terror? It does, but can you see that that the pain you've created has been created for these two reasons. You've been in denial of your own pain and mm. you've been refusing to feel your own terror. Mm. So you can see that repentance even is probably not going to be possible mm. until you're prepared to feel your terror and prepared to feel your own pain. Can you see that? Yeah. It's not really going to be possible to repent when, when the very things that you have to repent for yeah. have been triggered by the avoidance of those two things. So if I was to go through that, would that do anything for them? Like would it, would it alter anything within their souls or does is that have of no course effect? It, of course it's going to. And, and it, what, what, what you're going to find in your processing, and this is something that most of you have not experienced yet, but you're going to find that the very first people who oppose you are going to be your parents. They're going to be the first people who oppose you. Right? Now, if your parents aren't opposing you, then you haven't started yet. Because the very first per persons that are going to oppose you are your parents. Now, that's whether they're in spirit or on earth. It's highly, it <laughs> doesn't matter. Right? Now, if you work through enough emotion to not oppose your children going through emotion, of course that's going to have a huge positive benefit on your children, isn't it? They're not going to feel your opposition to their dealing with emotion. So that's going to make it a lot easier for them to deal with emotion, isn't mm. it? So it's definitely going to have a positive effect. But it doesn't mean that they will use their will to do it. Yeah. You can't guarantee that, but yeah. you want me to. <laughs> yeah. no, because, and yeah. that's guilt saying that. Yeah. That's guilt driving you. The fact that you did things to your children and now you feel bad about it and now you want them to go through things and now you want to be able to go through it yourself so they go through things. <laughs> and, and that's guilt. And guilt's not a loving emotion. It's a self-serving emotion mm. and it's self-serving in the fact that it helps you avoid repentance. Mm. Okay, thank you. Right, so you've got to be careful about these emotions. <laughs> yeah. And where are we up to? I hadn't chosen anybody yet. So let's go across to Barb. Right. Getting back to that terror point, in your outline in, the, um, in this section you said um, how to surrender to the feeling of terror about being emotionally overwhelmed. I get to the stage where um, I feel as if I'm just touching on it mm -hmm. and uh, it's as if I'm being suffocated or choked and mm -hmm. I've got a, I'm ripping my clothes off and I'm walking around and that walking around, that pacing just takes me right out of it. Mm. I don't go any further. That's right. Uh, most of you, you won't, most of you need to sensitise yourself to to the emotion of terror as an emotion, and it's going to take some time for you to do it, because um, because you, you're so desensitised to it at this stage. It's like you haven't, you know, most of you have, hadn't had no awareness it was even there, right? So so you're going to have to firstly sensitise yourself to it. By Which keep on doing by having more it? and more of these kind of experiences where you no longer take the same action towards it as you have in the past, so so I you know for me I had to lay on my bed and just I just laid on my bed sometimes for hours. I couldn't stay there. That was my problem. No, you can stay there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, I didn't allow myself to stay there. Yeah, you think you can't stay there, but you can stay there. Mm. You see, it's like, and this is what you tell yourself: I can't stay there, so I get up and straight away. You're out. You wanted to get out. So address the will. The will is saying, I want to get out of this. I want to get out of this. It feels too bad. I want to get out of it. Like if you're going to feel terror, you're going to have to want to get in it. Right? And that's, that's a whole lot of different, that, you know, that, that, that takes a lot of will. You're going to need the development of your will. And like I've said next to here, you see it right over here on the board, you know, the will is being exercised to refuse to be overwhelmed by the experience of terror and fear and grief. Desire to prevent pain, that's the exercise of the will. You need to flip that around, change the way in which you're exercising your will. So as soon as you get up and you walk around, pace around, you've exercised your will to avoid the feeling. 
the feeling has to come out of you and the only way it's going to come out of you is by being experienced. So you, you've, done, you've done the opposite of what you, is good for you. You think it's good for you. Well, I'm feeling that I can't um, handle it. I can't breathe. I can't handle it. Yeah, you so, can. Yeah. Like I told you in my example, I've passed out a number of times from not being able to breathe like through experience of terror. And I say a number of times, probably at least ten times. And and like that's how it is until until you get, you know, used to it. Okay, so keep on <laughs> <laughs> just get myself back into that situation again, but stay on the bed. Don't stay don't on the get bed. Up. Stay on the bed. Don't get yeah. up. Don't pace around. Stay on the bed. Feel feel it. Don't give you give yourself the outs that you normally give yourself. Mm. Stay with it as longer and longer and longer and longer. Don't punish yourself when you get out of it. Go there. I went again. Got out of it against my own against my own best interest. So next time I stay in this longer. Stay in this longer. Eventually you'll stay in it long enough that it will start coming up, and you'll start going through the bodily sensations and all sorts of other things that are a part of the release of the terror. And you'll know when you've done it because you'll probably sleep for at least one day afterwards or, or, or a long period of time afterwards. And when you wake up from that sleep, your body will be a lot more relaxed. You, you, you will feel quite different. And uh, your attitude to your life will change substantially and your attractions will change substantially. So you can measure how it's going, whether it's done or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, my, what I observe is that most people can't sit with the emotion of terror for a second let alone a minute or an hour. Like, honestly, it's just... Uh, you know, one of the things I've been talking about with Mary a lot is just sit with this emotion longer, darling. Sit with it longer. Stay with it longer. Like, the longer you stay with it, eventually you get to the point where you'll have it, right? Where you'll actually have it, the actual emotion. But if you can't stay with it, then that's your will being exercised to avoid it, right? And when you tell yourself, I can't, I can't handle it, there's your will, being exercised to avoid it. You need to see it as your will. It's not God made you to cope with any emotion. You can cope with it. Right? And I can keep on telling myself that, but it's not working. No, because you, you're using your will to avoid, avoid staying with it, you see. And so it's just a matter of more trust in God, more faith, that if I do this, it will benefit me in the long run. Yeah. So you need your faith needs to be improved. Your your attitude to truth needs to change. You be where you accept God's truth that this is an emotion. It's a multi generation emotion it has to come out of me. God can help it take it, take it out of me as long as I'm prepared to feel it. I've got to stick with it. I've got to feel it. I don't need to know what it is. I don't need to know how it got there. I don't need to know why it got there. I don't need to know where it came from. What generation it came from. Anything. I don't even go there. I just can't even stay with it at that yeah. time. Yeah. I don't need to know any of those things. Every question I ask about it is a question driven by the desire to know. I don't need to know. I need to start telling myself. I don't need to know why it's there. I don't need to know how it got there. All I need to do is learn how to feel it. That's all I need to do. It's blocking me from my relationship with God. It's blocking me from my education from God. <clears throat> Every... This fear in me governs my life. It governs my choices, governs my decisions. It, it, it dictates to me what I do every moment of my day. It's got to come out of me because it's killing me, <laughs> literally killing me. It's got to come out of me. It's, uh, it's depressing my soul. It's squeezing my soul out of life. And it's going to do that. While, and while that fear is in you, whether you're in the spirit world or here on earth, it, that's what it's going to do to you. It's going to constrain your life like bars prison bars around your soul yeah, it's got to come out and and you know my feelings are you've got to just let the process happen and i don't i don't know when and where you'll do that because that's a personal choice and decision you know all i know is you're going to have to do it <laughs> You're going to have to do it, particularly if you want a relationship with God. But even if you want any happiness at all, if you want any real happiness, you're going to have to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't really matter where it came from and who put it there. And 
all those things. No, thank you. I've, I'm just feeling it's one of my major problems at the moment. It yeah. is, yeah. And a few years ago, I didn't have any fear. <laughs> no, that's right. That's right. The majority, that's what I'm saying. It takes time to work through these. You work through these enough to see that that's there. And, and you've got to see it is there for yourself. It's no good AJ telling you, Jesus telling you that it's there. Like if you don't feel it's there, then you, then basically you're in denial from there down, and and you're going to have to undeny yourself, reverse the denial, and then eventually once you reverse the denial, you go yeah here it is huh he told me about that years ago, All right that, that I'd probably get to it at some point and here it is I can start feeling it now, does that make sense? But but everyone has it, everyone has it, just needs to go. Yeah. Bruce, you would like to ask? There's a mic coming back. Oh, the other ones. Yeah, either one's fine. Um, I'm getting the feeling that this the this t um, terror. It's um, a clue for it. From seems to me is from my maybe from my facades that I've generated. So I see that there's some characteristics of my facade. That I can see in it, yeah. That would there's a terror underneath that. Underneath it, that I'm certainly. that it's protecting. Certainly, yeah, okay. certainly. The type of addictions you develop are very much dependent on upon the type of terror that you have. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that's yeah right. they're all related, of course. And you, you, it's interesting that once you go through the emotion, then you understand yourself pretty well. Hey, it's like. Um, and you also understand other people pretty well too, you, you, because you because one, the the emotion of terror is what is desensitizing you to feeling other people's emotion, ironically, and the emotion of terror is what's desensitizing you to feeling your own emotion as well. You deal with the emotion of terror, and all of a sudden you're a lot more sensitive to what all, all the nuances of emotion, the different types of emotion that everybody has around you. And so now you can feel, you know, ah, oh, that person feels like this now. I didn't realise that before. Because your terror stopped you from feeling what they felt. Does that make sense? Your terror is the thing that prevents you from being sensitive in your body. It, it prevents you from being sensitive sexually. It prevents you from being sensitive emotionally. It prevents your, your body from feeling it's you know, like... Um, just give an example, like Mary can just sort of, um, she can not touch my back at all, just touch my spirit body and I'll have waves and waves of like pleasure all over my body, just tingling pleasure all over my body and she's not even touching my body, right? Now, years and years ago that didn't happen but now, now it happens. So it's a sensitizer, all of you can do that, all of you can have that experience and um, it's a sensitization to to your body, your physical body, your spirit body, and your soul that needs to be achieved, and that's only going to be achieved by releasing terror and pain. The more you release, the more sensitive you become. You also become sensitive emotionally. You become sensitive in the sense that you can no longer take actions that are unloving. You you know, even if you think, even if you thought there might be a personal benefit, but it hurt somebody else, you'd never do it because you're too sensitive emotionally. You couldn't cope with the outcome of doing it. Does that make sense? You couldn't hurt somebody purposefully because because you're too sensitive emotionally. It would hurt you even more than it hurts them. All right. So. Yeah, there's a lot of advantages when it happens, but it's the terror and the pain that prevents you from having that sensitized, that really sensitive state. The more sensitive your state, the more pleasure you have the potential to experience. You also have the potential to experience more pain. But the likelihood of you experiencing pain is a lot less because you're in a loving state. So, like, celestial spirits very sensitive to pain but doesn't experience any because <laughs> they're sensitive to any emotion. But they don't experience any because everything they do, everything they say, everything they, all the things, actions they take are all in harmony with love. So, therefore, they are all, there's no pain to be experienced. There's only pleasure to be experienced at that point. But they're just as sensitive to pain as 
any other person would be, who's open and become as sensitive as well. In fact, they're more so, because there's no terror in them anymore to prevent the sensitivity. Do you understand? The sensitivity, emotionally, physically, sexually, and all in all aspects of your life, is all about the amount of other emotions, pain and, and terror-based emotions that exist in your soul. Uh, the majority, majority of uh, like women on the planet complain a huge amount like about about sexual response, right? M and many women say they've not had orgasm very much at all, if at all. You know, they, it takes them a long time to have an orgasm. And all these other things. Well, that's all because of the lack of sensitivity to your body. Most women are very terrified of sexual response. They're terrified of those kind of things. So, so of course, there's a there's a lack of sensitivity. The, the, the norm for a woman is to ejaculate just like a man. That's the norm from God's perspective. But most women have desensitized from their bodies, and so they don't do that. Right? So there's a sexual sensitivity. Right? So most men are desensitized emotionally, terribly emotionally desensitized. So, you know, a woman might cry in a situation, but the man's there with a blank face and he's not crying at all but he doesn't realize the effect it's having on his pleasure and the effect he's having on his happiness uh, the reality is a uh, is that once you address that emotion and these emotions the sensitivity levels will go way up there about all things emotional moral sensitivity ethical sensitivity Right, physical sensitivity, spiritual sensitivity, sensitivity about love, sensitivity of other people's emotion. You'll know what they feel. You, they don't have to tell you what they feel. You feel what they feel better than they feel what they feel. <laughs> Unless they are just as sensitive as you. Yeah. Are you worried about that? <laughs> it's great, yeah, it is great. Honestly, why do you think celestial experience, spirits experience bliss? Right? It's because they're very, very sensitive to happy emotions. <laughs> yeah. Which also means they have to be sensitive to pain emotions. But of course they don't experience any pain because... They've brought their life into harmony with God's laws. And it's only when you sin that you experience pain. So because, it, because they no longer sin, they no longer experience pain. But they're just as sensitive to pain as any person would be, as any person who's sensitive in their state would be. But they don't experience it because they're not sinning. So if you, you've got a celestial spirit, you put him in a state like here on earth, like the 14 have happened, and then just one thing goes wrong, and all of, all of, any person who's one of the 14 feels like every single sin they've created is like a mountain because they're so sensitive to it. What you dismiss as nothing, they have intense emotions about. Yeah maybe gives you some idea of what the 14 are going to have to go through with regard to experience of pain. A lot worse than what anything that you can imagine going through. Because of their sensitivity to pain. Which far exceeds our first incarnation sensitivity. Yeah. Okay, well... I've well and truly done my time. I'm 15 minutes over, and I think if I can stick 15 minutes over for the day, I'll be probably happy because the next, the next presentation is very difficult to fit in one hour. So <laughs> if we come back at... Uh, can we come back at quarter past one, if that's all right? Uh, quarter past two, sorry. Yeah, quarter past two. Thank you.